Good evening and a very warm welcome to the 14th Wednesday webinar that World Horse Welfare have arranged and it's great to have you with us. You're joining us by Zoom and by joining us by Zoom if you've joined us before you'll know that you can take part in a couple of poll questions that we've got coming up this evening so that, that's great um, and if you've got any ideas that well, tonight's conversation is all about laminitis uh, but if you've got any ideas about what we might do for future uh, webinars and we'll be carrying them on in the new year then please do send us an email education at worldhorsewelfare.org since june we've covered a, a multitude of different subjects but uh, weight management and obviously tonight's subject of laminitis is is, is really relevant considering the challenges we have for our horse population in the UK but there's many other things that I know that the owners um, are challenged with so it would be great if you could send those ideas through and a very warm welcome for those who are joining us on Facebook live for this evening our 14th Wel uh, Welfare Wednesday webinar and um, it's good to have you with us and what we really want this to be is an interactive session so if you're joining us um, on Facebook live then please do share the live video and uh, what, during the course we've got the format of this evening we've got two presentations and I'm delighted to be joined by World Horse Welfare trustee Dr Sarah Coombs and also Dee Pollard who's previously at the Animal Health Trust now with the British Horse Society. It's great to have them both together and tonight's subject is on laminitis and after Sarah and Dee have spoken we will have plenty of time for questions so if you're on Facebook please use the comment function and ask your questions there and if you're on Zoom please use the Q&A function by all means have a ch chat using the chat function with other um, people joining us by Zoom but if you've got a question if you can please specifically uh, put them in the Q&A that will be just help us to, to manage the process. And as I say, if you've got ideas uh, for future w w webinars, then please do send that through to us around education at worldhorsewelfare.org. And please remember that all previous 13 webinars and tonight's webinar will be um, re are being recorded and will be put up on our Facebook on our, and our YouTube site. So please do go back and share those with your friends as well. Now, what I'm going to do, all being well, is I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I just wanted to, before we get into the introduction of Sarah, just to, um, if I can, there we go, um, ask you a poll question. Has your horse or one you care for ever had laminitis? Now there's a series of answers here. This is not a test, it's just to get a feel for those who are joining us this evening. So yes, my horse gets laminitis most years, down to no, I don't think my horse is the type to be at risk. So if you could, whilst you're uh, having a look at that question, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about World Horse Welfare, a charity that was founded in 1927 and at our heart it's all about supporting the horse-human partnership. Now, whether that's through caring for horses, through lobbying for change, or through education, which we do a lot of through uh, in partnership with many other organisations. Um, and obviously, that's a key feature of what these uh, Wednesday webinars are all about, to give us, as horse owners, help in being better horse owners. Because obviously, we're always learning, and it's, there's many challenges that we face as horse owners. And possibly, when we talk about laminitis, maybe alongside strangles, it uh, does put the fear uh, right through many horse owners when we mention just the word laminitis. But just how concerned should we be about it? And um, obviously, with the UK horse population fa facing its own e pandemic, epidemic of obesity, what, what in relation to that is it to laminitis? Now, of course, our understanding of what laminitis is, how we can avoid it, and how we can treat it has grown significantly over the last few years and, and thank the world for that because it is such a challenge but I'm delighted that we're able to share some of that latest thinking with you this evening through having our two speakers. Now before I introduce um, Sarah um, hopefully Basil will be able to give us the answers uh, the responses to the survey that we've had 
and look there's a, a really good spread from i think all the answers but just by uh, a short head no i manage my horse in a way that means he or she is unlikely to get laminitis but some uh, quite a few of you have said yes my my horse had it once twi or twice and we can manage him her very strictly so it doesn't happen again so it clearly is a, a, an issue for many of us and i hope this evening's um webinar will give us some guidance on how we can improve uh, the care for our horses so we minimize the chances they'll ever get uh, laminitis. So um, I'm now delighted to introduce, um, if I can move my s slides on, to Sarah Coombs who is a World Horse Welfare trustee as I've mentioned. She chairs our international, uh, sorry, our veterinary advisory committee and a member of our international committee and she is also one of the army of World Horse Welfare rehomers and is the proud rehomer of Princess Gabby. She also has a special interest in, in visiting China of which Je uh, Sarah and I did uh, 13 months ago to speak at a conference out in China how the world has changed since then. So Sarah, without further ado, over to you. Right. Oh, sorry. Brilliant. Uh, it was a good way of advertising fundraising for World Horse Welfare. I like that. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I didn't have much technical to do and that, that was it and I've started up already. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. Thank you for your, for your introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I think this evening's going to be very useful um, for, for um, an insight into laminitis and I think between Dr. D and myself, I think we, we probably cover a really good um, range of experience on this. I regard D as the brains um, in the, of the evening. What I am is a practicing vet who's going to give you some practical information into um, about what is genuinely a, a terrible disease. Uh, and this is the wonderful World Horse Welfare pony that I uh, rehomed, who's just coming into our kitchen. But she doesn't live in the house, I promise. So what is laminitis? Laminitis is very common and very familiar. And as, I, uh, as a result, I think it's often not treated with sufficient respect. It's an extremely painful condition of the foot. Um, it can affect any horse or pony at any time of year. So if you may have looked at this and thought, why are we doing a laminitis webinar in December? That's the reason. Um, and obviously tonight we're gonna to cover as much as we can, but it's a huge topic and I'm aware that we aren't gonna cover all of it um, in, in perhaps sufficient depth for everybody. I would just like to refer you to this excellent leaflet, which was put together by Sam and Alana at World Horse Welfare with um, the results of Dee's research on laminitis. And it's an excellent overview of the whole topic and provides some really practical advice for management and for um, the overview of, of the whole condition. So I would recommend that to you because we aren't going to cover everything that you want to know this evening otherwise. So we know that laminitis is a condition that affects the feet um, and the laminae as you're aware are the, the bond between the pedal bone down the centre of the foot and the hoof capsule. And this cross section through horse's foot shows it very nicely. Um, so the laminae, um, a, a bit like a, a way that Velcro forms an attachment, um, they shear apart, um, which obviously leads to serious uh, issues for the foot and pain, um, and a change in position of the pedal bone, which can then penetrate the sole. Um, I think, Although this is, um, this is obviously a, a, a laminated foot, you need to be thinking about this as a condition that affects the whole horse or pony, um, and that will inform your management. Um, it's, there's a whole sequence of events from the, the start of the condition to the changes that you see in the foot, some of which are not fully clear to us yet. Um, there are enzymes involved, there is a change in the circulatory, um, system in the foot uh, but what you need to think of is that this affects the whole horse and, and that as I say will inform the way in which you manage, manage it. 
and obviously this, this sets off a sequence of events which can be devastating for the horse as the weight of the horse acts down on that pedal bone and once it is, it's no longer spread around the hoof capsule it gives the uh, it, it predisposes the uh, pedal bone to penetrate through the sole which is pretty much a disaster. Now if you're already bored and you want to go make a cup of tea this is the important message from this whole evening I would say it, it's you must not underestimate laminitis and the key message is not to get it in the first place. Um, it's extremely painful. The pain, or the pain that horses and ponies experience from laminitis, in my experience, is equivalent to what you'd expect with a fracture or a serious life-threatening colic. As I say, it's a common condition. We tend to take it uh, a bit too lightly often. Our members of my profession do. Um, owners tend to sometimes think well he's just a little bit footy or whatever if you've got a pony that's looking like this and it's out of grass that you must not wait for it to happen and then think you'll deal with it um, it's an extremely painful condition once you've had an episode of, of laminitis you're talking about long-term daily management if you like you're talking about damage limitation rather than repair um, this long-term process can be extremely expensive. Even if you're insured, you will, it's not uncommon for you to go out of the, the top end of your insurance uh, money. Um, and you need to have a very good relationship with your vet and your farrier, and you need to work as a team. And despite your very best intentions and all of the expense and all of the input, um, it's, there's no guarantee of success in a serious case and unfortunately you may be looking at having to euthanase the animal. So do not get laminitis in the first place. If you can recognise the early signs you have a better chance of um, a favourable outcome. Now this pony here, it's not rocket science to recognise that this pony is in, in trouble um, and I'd expect you know the, the, the youngest Pony Club D child to recognise that this pony is not happy. What we're looking at are much more subtle changes. So the pony might stand shifting weight from one foot to the other at rest. Um, quite often, because they aren't nodding lame on one leg, they're lame in both front feet commonly. All you see is a shortness of stride, so they're a bit stubby looking. When you go from grass onto a hard surface, they'll, they'll, they'll be reluctant to go forward. Uh, quite often when you want them to turn, they don't want to turn. So these are the small signs that everybody that has the type of horse or pony, which basically, as I say, can be any horse or pony, it, it, these signs you need to be looking for, particularly reluctance to pick up a foot. So if there's no obvious reason why they wouldn't want to pick up the foot, then you need to be thinking this could be an early laminitis indicator. Um, and those signs, as I say, you need to learn to pick those up because they can be a big factor. The early detection can be a big factor in how likely your outcome is to be successful. Um, those of you that watched the um, webinar that Sue Dyson did all about pain and the ethogram of pain, basically, as a lot of horse owners kind of think they knew already, but it takes someone extremely clever to, to actually demonstrate it, like Sue. But if you look at this horse's face, he, he's clearly unhappy. Um, and I, obviously, that's not grounds in itself to pick the phone up to the vet on a Sunday night, but it's one of the signs that you need to learn to recognize. You know your horse better than anybody else does and you need to recognize when they're not happy. So we've already talked about their reluctance to turn on a hard surface. Quite often, if you think about that picture of the cross section of the horse's foot where the pedal bone becomes closer to the sole, it may only be very minor, the, the change, but even so, you then get an increased sensitivity. So as soon as you walk them off the grass verge onto a stony surface or an uneven surface, they'll be very sensitive. If they have 
laminitis in their back feet as well, quite often they'll very sensibly lie down. And that actually, again, if you think about what's happening, that takes the weight off uh, and stops that downward pressure on the pedal bone. So that's actually quite useful. But bear in mind also that we're talking about an animal that may suddenly have been box rested when it's used to being out. So it's had a change of management and we know that that change of management is quite often associated with colic. So you need to be mindful and look at the bigger picture to be sure that we're not lying down because we've got a low grade impacted colic, for instance. Um, as I said, they're going to look sad. And it's important to assess these animals in walk and not trot. You know, we'll talk a little bit about instability in the foot in a minute, but um, it, if you can see that they're lame in walk, you don't need to trot them. And quite often, uh, you see people trotting up ponies that are suspected to have laminitis, and it's just not necessary. Um, so just be a bit wary of that. Now, your vet and your farrier will obviously look at changes in the feet. I mean, you know, you'll be picking your, the feet up to see if it's a stone or anything very obvious that's causing the lameness. Um, and quite often when the farrier comes to trim, they will be the first person that notices that there's early bruising in the sole, like in the picture here of the sole with a pink around the rim. Um, and quite often, that's the first thing that, that, that anybody will notice before you've, you've even uh, picked it up yourself, any of the early changes we've de described. We know from studies that have done, been done that a lot of owners don't recognise when their horse is lame. Um, so again, if, if the farrier has picked up this sort of bruising, or you can see the bruising on the outside of the hoof capsule, then uh, that's significant. And don't think, oh, I must, do something about that at some point, you know, and, and think about other things. It's important you deal with it now. Um, the picture at the bottom you can see uh, where you can feel the digital pulse. This is something it's very useful to get used to feeling for, particularly if you've got a, a pony or a horse that's had laminitis before. Um, it's quite easy, but it's like a lot of things you need to get practiced at it. And it if you don't use enough pressure, you won't feel the pulse. If you use too much pressure, you won't feel the pulse. So you need to practice. And of course, very commonly with, with uh, laminitic feet, as with any foot uh, infection or whatever, you'll get increased heat in the feet. And again, your hands are the best tool that you've got, but you need to train them. You need to get used to feeling your horse's feet and checking their digital pulse on a regular basis, just so that it, you've got that skill if you come to need it. And you will find that uh, you might not think that you can pick it up, but when it's wrong, you will pick it up. It's like a lot of these kind of things. In terms of longer term changes and what may go on to happen next, if you look at the picture on the left, you can see the rings where the hoof is growing down from the coronary band and there are irregular growth rings. And you quite often get the growth rings that are much closer together at the front of the foot and wider apart at the heel. So that's quite a classic picture that will tell you if you've, you've the ponies had laminitis in the past or, you know, basically from the coronary band to the toe is a nine month time frame. And if you look at the uh, rings on the foot, you can, pretty much date what's been happening in the last nine months of the pony's management. And then as we talked about before, um, in terms of this, this next thing that could happen is that the pedal bone unfortunately comes right down through and is penetrates through the sole of the foot, which again is extremely painful and can happen with the best management and the hardest working team of vet farrier owner. Predisposing factors, um, Dee's going to talk about these in more detail. What, I'm quite old. When I, started, when I first qualified as a vet, everybody said, you put the pony out in long grass and, and the pony gets laminitis from the grass. One of the biggest changes that we, has come in since I first qualified is that we now recognise that 
most cases of laminitis are ba basically a metabolic problem. Uh, and in fact, some studies say that 90% of all laminitis, laminitis cases uh, are basically metabolic. Um, the key thing to think about is obesity. Um, and obesity is the kind of common factor of, of, all, the, of all. So you've got a metabolic issue which is um, made worse by obesity or is, is the obesity can call the cause the metabolic issue. Um, all of these cases, whether they've got a, which as I say, mostly have a metabolic basis, are made worse by increased sugar and starch in the diet. Um, I probably should say here that um, we're talking, well, most of the time with this, the laminitis I'm describing, we're talking about the common form of laminitis. Of course, it's possible if you've got a horse that's very sick with a retained, a mare with a retained placenta or something that's had um, severe diarrhea or something, some kind of toxemia, you can get laminitis as a secondary effect of, of that. And the management of those will be the same, but those aren't the ones we're talking about here. Um, understanding metabolic laminitis. Now I did call this initially the simple person's guide to metabolic laminitis because basically it's quite complex and you can get lost talking about insulin dysregulation and all of that. And, and it, it's very, I, personally, I find it very interesting, but you know, you and I are standing together on your yard on a Sunday night with a pony and with laminitis. We don't need to understand the, all of the minute details of this to be able to move forward. Um, there are broadly speaking, two main metabolic syndromes, but even that is, is not strictly accurate because quite often you'll have the two of them together. So don't worry about whether your horse has got equine metabolic syndrome or uh, the next one we'll talk about, which is PPID, what we used to call Cushing's, um, except that um, we'll talk about Cushing's in a minute. It, it makes a difference in terms of the test that the vet will do and the possibility of treatment. So it's basically all about insulin. We think that as an evolutionary adaptation, there's a genetic um, predisposition to uh, alter insulin metabolism so that the ponies that are supposed to be starving on the side of a mountain in the winter can survive and get enough nutrition to meet their needs. Obviously, that isn't the way that we keep most of our horses and ponies. So that's where the issue comes in. Um, but that's why those native breeds and the Arabians and the Iberian horses have this, uh, what, what sometimes referred to as a thrift gene, which can, can uh, set off this whole se sequence of events. So what you need to know is it's all about the insulin. That leads to obesity. Obesity predisposes to laminitis and diabetes. Um, if you look at these ponies, if you can, you can't always distinguish between the ponies that have got which, by looking at the pony, you can't necessarily distinguish which metabolic problem it's got, except that if you look at these pictures here, they tend to be the horses with the fat packs. So they have particularly commonly the very heavy, very hard crest. And then they have the sort of big packs immediately behind the saddle and over the quarters. And a lot of you will, will think, be able to picture those kind of changes. Quite often they'll have those fat packs, even though their ribs are showing. So those are the ponies that generally are more affected by FY metabolic syndrome. And the important thing about the fat packs is that they release all sorts of um, biologically active chemicals, like, for instance, cortisol. But you, again, you don't really need to know that. Um, what you need to know is that your vet will probably want to do some blood tests and check what's going on. And you'll want to reduce weight and increase exercise. So this is the other main type of metabolic laminitis. And I've put there, they don't all look like that. If they all look like that, we'd all be able to diagnose them without a blood test. So very long hair coat, sometimes drink a lot and pee a lot, sometimes are prone to skin infections, sometimes prone to excessive sweating. Well, they will be if they're 
as woolly as that. But again, those changes can be there, but they're very subtle. Uh, quite often they have the bulging fat in, immediately above the eye. And this is what we used to call Cushing's degree, disease, still do sometimes. And it's a disorder of the pituitary gland, which is in the brain. And again, that leads to increased cortisol. Uh, cortisol, as you know, is involved in, in the stress response. And again, this has an effect on insulin metabolism and leads to obesity. The good thing, relatively good thing about this condition is that you can test for the hormone relatively easily. Um, and that test is very well developed now. Uh, it, the results will vary ac according to the time of year, but the labs that do it are pretty geared up now as to um, what is normal for a given time of year. The good thing about this is that you can treat the, them with pergolide. It's expensive, they sometimes don't like to eat it, but at least it's there and it usually works quite well. Um, and you'll notice that the management is the same, reduced weight, increased exercise. When we talk about increased exercise, it's important to remember that we don't want to cause pain. So I'm not talking about dragging your pony around the yard when it's hardly able to stand up. Exercise is really important. Exercise affects metabolism, so it's, it's dealing with, um, it, you know, reverses some of the metabolic changes we talk about. Obviously, it leads to um, weight reduction, but you can't do it until they're, well, I, I advise my plants not to do it until the, they're uh, pain-free without medication. So obviously, we're quite a long way down the track uh, to get to that stage quite often. Laminitis treatment is an emergency. Um, I think it's definitely the case that it's not just you that, you know, it's not just owners that underestimate laminitis, it's vets as well. We're all really familiar with it, you know, it, but it is an emergency and particularly if you go out to the field and they're seriously stuck and doing that thing of leaning right back off their feet and sweating and all of that. Um, move them as little as possible. If you've got to take a trailer down to a, a paddock that's half a mile down the road on the road, you know, where they have to walk down the road to get home, you can't get them back. You need to load them up and get them back in a trailer or something. It's very important to consider that instability. If you think of the bond between the hoof wall and the, and the bone in the foot as having been fractured, then you think of it in the right terms. And in the same way as if you have a fracture case, you provide first aid by providing stability with a splint or something until you can assess the horse and decide of a plan of action. You need to provide stability because the, the pain comes with the instability of that bone moving around within the foot. I am a huge fan of these styrofoam supports like in the picture. Um, I carry a sheet of, well, not a huge sheet, but a sheet of this which is effectively just roofing insulation in the back of my car and have been known to whip out the bread knife and uh, make a set of styrofoam supports but seriously i mean obviously you can buy them and they come in a box with gaffer tape and stuff but they're they're very very useful um if you're stuck without anything and we're in the you know we're in our sunday night scenario you can put cotton wool under their feet and wrap, wrap them up with um gaffer tape or something but it just provides that support to the whole of the soul and the heel and takes some of the, well, shares the pressure so that it's not all acting down on the toe. Uh, manage pain. So again, as I say, pain relieving medication and soul support. Uh, tr when I say treat any underlying cause, I'm talking about the retained placenta case or the toxic colic case, you know, which, which obviously they will be going on. And then when you can, you need to get the, the feet x-rayed and know where you are and what you can do in terms of trimming to help relieve the pressure on the pedal bone. So that's the vet bit. This is your bit. You've got to manage the pain. And again, part of the way of supporting your feet is to stable them on a really deep bed and stable them up to the door. Quite often people have a fantastic deep bed and then they have a three feet gap from the door back to the bed so they won't kick the bedding all over the place. 
and the pony stands with its feet on the concrete. Very deep bed. I would suggest to people they put a rubber mat right in the doorway. And if you have a serious laminitis case, you may be looking at keeping it in the box on a deep bed for nine months, which if you remember is what we said is the, what you probably know is the length of time it takes for that hoof growth to, the hoof to grow out. That's a big deal. That's a big commitment. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Pain relief, so we're mostly talking about non-steroidals like Bute and Danalon, Paracetamol, um, soul support again. And I cannot emphasize enough that you need to be able to provide really good nursing care for the horse. It needs to be a happy, comfortable horse, or you need to be thinking about whether it should be keeping going. Um, and that includes basic hair like teeth and things. If you're going to be putting it on a high forage diet and, it, and you haven't done its teeth for two years, then don't be surprised if it then gets an impacted colic. And then there'll be investigations. And we talked about that, metabolic blood tests and radiographs. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, diet is critical and I won't dwell on this too much because I suspect we're getting short of time, but um, forage, forage, forage. High forage, low, low starch diet, no molasses, no pelleted food, even the pellets that say they're for ponies. Um, and minimum of one and a half percent body weight forage, trickle feed, nice, one of these nice uh, small hay nets, uh, either dry hay or soaked hay, depending on how much weight you've got to lose. I'm a huge fan of barley straw. Um, barley straw is a great bedding. It's cheap, which if you're gonna keep something on a deep bed for nine months is a big issue. There's no plastic um, and uh, they will eat it. And if they eat it, it's not the worst thing. You don't, we don't do starvation anymore. You know, as I say, when, we, when I first started, was told how to treat laminitic, she shut them in a stable and gave them one slice of hay all day. Um, you need to remember that you've got to keep your gut back, their gut bacteria happy, particularly when they're being fed um, anti-inflammatory drugs. And you need to give them sufficient nutrients to repair. So a forage balancer, which is that designed for laminitics, is uh, a very useful way of providing that. Then, very importantly, um, you need to use radiographs. Radiographs, once the horse is able to stand um, and is able to do it. So as I say, you need to get pain under control. Um, radiographs so that you can then uh, look at the prognosis for how things are going to go. And then there's a lot of teamwork with the vet and the farrier trimming on a regular basis. Um, and then there we could talk all evening about the options for shoes and clogs and boots. Suffice it to say, there's a lot out there and you need a farrier who's prepared to be creative and prepared to try something and if it's not working, try something else. Be careful not to set off the pain cycle. As I said, you know, pain makes things worse because of the effect of the cortisol and stress. Quite often you'll get um, abscesses because if you think about that, that picture of the foot, there's a gap between the the hoof wall and the pedal bone and, and pass some liquid and well there's, there's, quite, there's serum in there anyway and quite often that will become infected. So you put an infection on top of an already laminated foot and it's very painful. So that's the sort of hurdle you're going to get to deal with as you're going along. Um, and all of this may lead you to have to do some tough thinking about the quality of life that this pony has got. You know, I, I've many times, you know, you think you've done absolutely everything you've tried and tried and tried and things just aren't meant to be. And you need to start thinking about that if, if you're not getting anywhere and the ponies need severe pain. Preventing recurrence. Again, this is a whole evening's conversation. I would recommend, like with a lot of chronic conditions, keep a diary because particularly with the EMS cases, they can throw you a curveball of a serious laminitis episode for no apparent reason. 
you know you just you think Man, where did that come from you know and if you keep a diary um, and write everything in it so your regular weight checks the date of your tr your trims anything else that happens your worming any of that stuff the day that you left it outside for half an hour longer than it should have been you know at least then you can start to see a pattern which i find with my clients it's actually a bit of a comfort because you don't feel like you're going to get so many nasty shocks meticulous dietary management as i said you've got to keep up that um weighing the, the forage they're getting soaking if you need to providing everything they need when you get to the point of grazing them making sure they're not out longer than they should be um, ongoing medical management will include perhaps monitoring your pergolide dose and changing that you may need to do blood tests to monitor it um, weight control is a huge part of this and you you'll know that there are various weighing tapes you can use and systems for monitoring body condition and then as i say once they're sound without medication you can start exercising them in hand and they love it you know they love it's not it, it, it's not uh, something that ponies like is to be chucked in a paddock by themselves with no attention from their humans and even if you're taking a pony for a walk the same as you take a dog for a walk it's really useful um you must have access to stabling in my opinion because you're going to have to restrict turnout um and and i i don't know how you would do that if you didn't have access to a, either a field shelter or a stable to shut them in for some of the time um there are grazing systems that i think d is going to talk about where you can encourage them to move around the field um so so they don't tend to put so much weight on and you may want to look into strip grazing um, and there are various um, grazing muzzles on the market which suit some ponies don't suit other ponies you know you have to you have to try and as i say you must 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 keep up regular trimming uh, this may need to be done every four weeks every six weeks and quite often it's a good idea to give them some pain relief the night before and on the morning that they're going to be done so that you don't set up a pain cycle so i think we're nearly at the end now <laughs> we need to we need to wind up sarah yeah yes just just finishing uh yes don't allow your horse to get laminitis in the first place that's the only thing you have to remember do take it seriously and make sure that your vet and your farrier do as well and do commit to the intensive management that you need to do um and if you can't commit to that for any very good reasons which you know beyond your control probably you need to consider euthanasia sorry to finish on a gloomy note but it doesn't have to be like that <laughs> thank you very much for your time <laughs> Brilliant, thank you, Sarah. That's excellent, and lo lots of um, sort of detail there, which we'll get to in the uh, the discussion session. So, if you're watching on Facebook, please do keep your questions coming on uh, on the comments section, and if you're watching on Zoom, please do add those questions to the Q and A. Lots on Facebook, not so many on Zoom at the moment. Let's see if we can even that up. Um, so now I'm going to share my screen again, and um, we will start with um, a second poll question. Um, now, if you were listening to Sarah or you were early on, you might, you might have a clue to this. When is laminitis most likely to occur? One of the four seasons, seasons even, any time, or depends on the cause? Again, no right or wrong answers here in the main. We just want to get a feel and get a bit of interaction. So do please, uh, whilst you're um, thinking about that, um, I'm going to introduce you to D Pollard. So I'm going to take, take that now and, and hopefully um, move that on. There we go. On to, to D, who's a great friend of World Horse Welfare, originally from South Africa, uh, then moved to the Royal Veterinary College in London and spent a, a good while at the Animal Health Trust before now moving to uh, the British Horse Society, where she is helping on researching the really vital area of equestrian road safety. Um, and I love it on my notes here. It goes, in her spare time, 
and that rather assumes Dee has any spare time, but she works with other researchers to consult on data analysis and statistical methods. And I know she's done a lot with Sue Dyson. Men um, Sarah mentioned Sue and the work she's doing. She also runs an own education Facebook page, which is called Care Equine Education, with fellow researchers, Dr. T Tamsin Furtado, who we very much hope is going to be a, a future presenter on our webinars, and of course spends time with her two ponies, the 24-year-old Halflinger and 12-year-old Coloured Cob. I don't know the names of either, so I know Dee will let us know what their names are. Um, but before you find out the names of Dee's two horses, um, then I think Basil will hopefully be able to give us some uh, answers. So there, 22% um, think spring, but 52% uh, will say any time. Um, I know we'll come back to discuss that um, in um, in the discussion panel as well. So uh, with that introduction, um, and I'll stop sharing my screen, uh, Dee, over to you. Thanks very much, Roly. Um, and just as I'm setting up my screen, I'm going to tell you the names of my ponies. Um, so the Hufflinger is called Canny, and the Cobb is called Winston. I love right. the name Winston, that's excellent. <laughs> So I think everyone can see my screen, hopefully. Yes, you're good. Cool. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, and thanks very much to Sarah for doing a great job of introducing laminitis and how we can recognize it. So I'm going to very much more focus on the research behind um, laminitis, but then also use that research to give an example of how we can use research to implement it in a practical way um, in a case study. So as we know from Sarah's talk, laminitis is unfortunately common, it is painful, and it is debilitating. Um, and from our research that we did um, uh, in combination with World Horse Welfare, we found that one in 10 horses or ponies developed at least one episode of laminitis every year. Um, and we also know that many of them will develop multiple episodes per year as well. So it is a big welfare concern. And up to a quarter of euthanasias in this research project were due to laminitis related complications. So it is quite a big problem. So how, oh, this is what I wanted to talk to you about first. So we did a little project looking at how well owners are able to recognize laminitis. So we uh, parted, partnered up with 25 vet practices throughout Great Britain, and we asked them to give us information on the next couple of laminitis episodes that they diagnosed um, in practice. So what we were really looking for was to see when owners said, I think my horse has laminitis, did this marry up with what the vet then diagnosed? So we found that in uh, over half of the cases, the owner did call the vet and said, uh, my horse is lame, I think it's laminitis. And actually in all of those cases, the vet also then subsequently diagnosed laminitis. So we were thinking, yay, owners, you know, seem to, to be able to recognize laminitis quite well. But then in the other um, side of that, we found that actually 40 Two and 42% of the episodes, the owners call the vet and said, my horse is lame, there's something wrong with them. Either I don't know what is wrong, or it, I think they're lame because they have arthritis or colic or an abscess. Um, and actually the vet then said, I'm afraid it's actually laminitis. So this does highlight that we need to, to carry on raising awareness of especially those subtle signs that Sarah, um, Sarah spoke about. Um, so not just looking for that typical laminitic stance of the pony leaning back, but thinking more of those collection of subtle signs that can help us say, well, oh, actually this is laminitis and we need to act quickly. Interestingly, in this research, we also found that 62% um, of the horses or ponies with laminitis were considered by the vet to be overweight, and owners were less likely to recognize laminitis if it was in a horse breed versus a pony breed. So they were much better at saying, oh, this Shetland looks like it's laminitic, but when it was a thoroughbred or a, or a warm blood, they, they didn't think of laminitis initially. So what are the risk factors? Um, so Sarah already introduced um, the insulin, which is sort of what I consider the, the main culprit in laminitis. And so diagnosing these underlying conditions which disrupt normal hormone function, and that's your uh, PPID and your equine metabolic syndrome. 
So with um, equine Cushing's disease or PPID, we have that option of using medication in conjunction with uh, management to control PPID. With EMS, it is much more, the focus is much more on management. Um, if you think about likening it to type 2 diabetes in people, then we know that it requires a whole lifestyle change. So that includes sort of exercise, but also the diet, um, low starch, low um, carbohydrate, low sugars, because we want to prevent those spikes in insulin and that um, dysregulation of insulin. And we often think of sort of sugary uh, feeds as being in our bucket feed, but actually when we think about where our horses are getting most of their food or forage from is either grass or hay. Um, so even hay, even though it looks like it's very non-nutritional, can be quite high in sugar. And that's why one of the things that we sometimes recommend is soaking hay to get rid of some of those sugars. Now, another risk factor, and this is quite controversial because research is still not quite decided whether corticosteroids really are a risk factor or not, but there is some evidence that steroids can contribute to laminitis, but if there is already existing hormonal disruption um, already in the horse, so if the horse has PPID or EMS already, then personally, I would err on the side of caution and think about maybe alternative treatments to corticosteroids. So the next big laminitis risk factor and something that I'm really passionate about because I think it's something we can, we can do, we can change this, is weight gain and obesity in our horses. So our research found that recent weight gain more than doubled the likelihood of laminitis developing in the future. And this weight gain was often unintentional because owners were telling us um, most of them were either trying to maintain their horse's weight or actually get the horses to lose weight, but the horses were gaining weight. And lots of other studies back this up as well that found that obese body condition, and that's either general obesity or um, regional adiposity. So um, like Sarah was talking about, the fat pads and where their distribution is can be quite important. So in this picture, we have a pony with a cresty neck, and a cresty neck is one of those um, quite classic signs that there might be something going on underneath like equine metabolic syndrome. It can be a visual indicator of hormonal disruption. And owners sometimes um, have trouble recognizing what's muscle and what's fat in these cresty necks. So my sort of rule of thumb is that if you were to kind of take your finger and squint one eye and put it just so that it covers those red arrows, and that's actually what the pony's neck would look like without that lump on, of fat on top. Now I'm going to come back to sort of weight management because it is such a, a integral part of laminitis management and it will help with regulating of insulin as well. So other risk factors, uh, we spoke about breed predisposition, the thrifty gene, sort of our, our native ponies being very much more um, good doer types and putting on weight relatively quickly. Um, so these we found were sort of our risk factor, high risk factor uh, groups. Um, we also found ponies that, and horses that had history, uh, a history of laminitis were more likely to develop future episodes. Now, whether this is because they still had undiagnosed or uncontrolled um, metabolic problems, or whether they had already had significant changes within their feet, which weakened the lamella uh, junction, which then made their feet more likely to have go on and have further damage. And we also actually found that the longer it took the horse to recover from a previous episode of laminitis, the more likely they were to then develop subsequent episodes. Um, and we also found, interestingly, with um, shoeing and trimming, we found that lameness after shoeing or trimming was associated with future laminitis development. Now, it's hard to say whether this is because of the style, type of shoeing or trimming that was going on, or whether that soreness could almost be a precursor that something was going on and 
um, that laminatus was already rumbling on in the background, which then once you kind of change the dynamics of the foot and the loading and the weight bearing, it could make it, the lameness more obvious. Interestingly, with um, shoeing and trimming, we also found that a risk factor was if there were larger intervals between um, um, shoeing and trimming, so intervals of greater than eight weeks. So that's why we always recommend that you um, have a good relationship with your farrier and you see them regularly, even if they come and, and see your pony. And even if the pony doesn't, or horse doesn't need a trim or, a, or shoeing at that time, it's just having those kind of much more regular um, hoof checks is quite important. And your farrier can also help recognize if there is any sort of pain in the feed going on. So we spoke about sort of our high risk group, which is our native ponies, but is it only native ponies that develop laminitis? So in this graph, we have the rate of laminitis across different types of breeds. And we can see on, on the far left, we have the Connemaras, the New Forest, the Shetlands, other native breeds, which included the Fells, the Dales, the Highlands. And we can see that these have higher rates of laminitis compared to the other breeds. The blue bar represents just a single episode per horse, then the uh, purple bars are whether they had multiple episodes. We can also see that the rate of multiple episodes was higher in our native ponies. Then next we have the Welshies, and this was actually a mix of Welsh A's all the way up to D's, so we couldn't separate them out well enough. But then we can also see we have warm bloods, Arabs, other ponies, thoroughbreds, mix of other horses, and then we have our drafts and cobs, who, who in our research actually had the lowest rate of laminitis, which was quite interesting. So unfortunately, I think every horse owner needs to be aware of laminitis. Um, although we have our high-risk breeds, um, any horse or pony can develop laminitis if the circumstances align. We also found some interesting health-related factors um, that would require further study. So we found horses that were lame due to a soft tissue injury were more likely to develop laminitis. Now these were mainly our tendon and ligament injuries. And we know that these often take quite a long time to repair and there's often a long rehabilitation period as well. So whether the laminitis was due to the actual injury or whether it was more to do with the changes in management um, and exercise and perhaps circulation because the horse is now not being exercised as much. So kind of the secondary effects of having a soft tissue injury. Um, we also found grazing management and diet factors, uh, which once again also are really interesting and require further study. So we found um, horses and ponies that were on short-term morning grazing were actually more likely to develop laminitis, and this was usually between one to three hours in the morning, and then they were taken off grass for the rest of the day. And we also found that uh, horses and ponies that had grazing muzzles on, only part of the time that they grazed were also more at risk. So this is really interesting. Um, and my theory is that this is related to compensatory eating. So we know from previous research that ponies are really clever. And if they know that they're only going to be allowed onto grass for a very short time every day, they can actually learn to just eat quicker. So within that three hour period a day, they can pretty much double or even increase their grass intake even more over that time. So that's really important to consider if you are only letting your horse out um, onto unrestricted grazing for a short period of time. And similarly with grazing muzzles, um, they did the study with uh, miniature horses, I think it was in the States. And they, they found that they had three groups. They had ponies that were muzzled for 24 hours. They had ponies that were muzzled for 10 hours and those that were unmuzzled. And when they were allowed onto grazing, those ponies that were unmuzzled and the ones that had mu uh, grazing muzzles on for only 10 hours put on weight, where the, one, where the ones that had muzzles on for the whole time lost weight. So once again, this is probably sort of a, a rebound compensatory effect because they've had the muzzle on for 10 hours, the muzzle gets taken off and they just sort of gorge themselves. So with managing um, grazing, 
I always think it's better to sort of restrict the volume or amount of brass rather than the time the horse spends on it, just to kind of prevent this compensatory uh, gorging effect. We also, um, and you guys answered this, this really well following um, Sarah's talk, so should we only worry about laminitis in the spring? So unfortunately not, um, laminitis occurs all year round. Um, and here uh, there are, I present two graphs. The one on the left is looking at veterinary diagnosed episodes of laminitis. The one on the right is owner reported. And we once again have the rate of laminitis and then the months of the year along the bottom. So we can see that um, in both cases, in January, had actually quite a high rate of laminitis. Laminitis dipped, uh, re laminitis rates dipped in, in sort of um, late winter, early spring, went up again sort of late uh, spring into summer, then dipped again, and then went up again as slightly in the autumn. And there were no months um, where there was no laminitis. So we um, have to just be vigilant all year round, unfortunately, with laminitis. So this leads me on to the case study. So how can we use all this knowledge to actually implement interventions or um, prevent laminitis in practice? So this is a case study of Welsh mountain ponies, and there were a young group ranging in age from one to four years old. So two of the so when I refer to older I mean sort of the four-year-olds and then the younger ones were sort of um, around one or two years of age and they were separated into age groups but they live as herds and two of the older ponies developed laminitis and they needed immediate intervention but if you remember the risk factors that we spoke about a lot of these ponies were overweight so that's one of our risk factors they were the high risk native a breed, Welsh mountain ponies, and two of them had already developed laminitis. So two of them had a history of laminitis. So that's three risk factors. So this was a ticking time bomb and we really needed to sort of put intervention in right away. So we needed to find a good strategy to help the older ponies lose weight and maintain that weight loss uh, or maintain that healthy weight and prevent the younger ponies from getting overweight as they got older. So what were the particular challenges with these ponies? Um, there were too few ponies and too much grass. Even though it looks like there is not a lot of grass there, these ponies were not getting anything else. They were not getting hay, they were not getting bucket feed. They were just on grass and they were overweight. And it was interesting to see even within a group that was managed completely the same and that was the same age, there was a lot of variation in the, at an individual level. Some ponies were very overweight, others were slightly overweight, and there was even a couple that looked pretty okay. So the ponies lived in herds, but as I said, there were different individual needs. Um, there's a heavy focus on grazing management and um, because these ponies are unbacked, um, so there was no option to kind of exercise them really. So we really just had to focus on sort of um, managing their grazing. We had to think, so we had to work with the yard manager and the yard vet and um, make any interventions quite easy so that once they were put in place, they could be carried on quite easily. Um, we wanted to consider both the physical and mental well-being of ponies. So as Sarah said, we don't, we, we don't do starvation. That's just not something that we do with horses. We know that they're trickle feeders and they need to constantly be sort of foraging and eating. So that's something we had to consider and we wanted to keep them in, in, the, in the groups of friends. But obviously also we had to consider the cost of any, any intervention. So the first thing that we did, and these ponies were weighed on a weigh bridge regularly, which was really nice, but nobody had kind of taken all their data and looked at actually what was happening to the weight of the ponies over time. So very simple to do, take all the weight, retrospective weights, all the old weights, and just plot them on a graph. And here we can see that the weights are steadily going up over time. So you can say, well, they're young ponies, so they could be growing. So just looking at weight alone doesn't really tell us what condition the ponies are in or how much fat they're carrying. But when we looked at the ponies and body condition score them and actually felt where the fat was, 
we could see that unfortunately they weren't just growing vertically, they were growing horizontally as well. So definite intervention needed to take place. So at around um, March, April-ish 2019, we started playing around with different um, interventions, different management strategies. And you can, see you can see that there are a lot of options and not everything will always work for everyone. So you have to play around a little bit until you find what works for you and what works for your horse. But you can see that sort of around May, June-ish uh, time, we found a good strategy and we can see the weight subsequently going down. So that's what we wanted to see. So what did we do? So we had two groups of ponies. These were our older four-year-olds. Um, and we divided them into two groups, one with three ponies and one with six. And we set up sort of a combination of a truck system and a strip grazing system. So what we essentially had um, was the boundary of the field was uh, where those trees are. And then we created an inner fence, which would create a track around the outside of the field, which is this uh, yellow line. The water source was this blue uh, dot. So we essentially started strip grazing the track around away from the water all the way around until we got to the other side. And then we started strip grazing the middle in strips. So you can see we um, fenced off a strip and then we slowly let the ponies onto patches of grass until they'd eaten all of that down. We would close that down and let it recover and then we'd open the next strip and repeat. So let the ponies graze down until they were finished and then repeat. So in this way, we were able to sort of manage the amount of grass that they were eating. It wasn't just constantly um, increasing the area and amount of grass they were having. They were limited to once they'd graze around the track, then those strips would be shut off to recover and then they'd get a new strip. And it was also nice that they then, in order to get to their water and to their shelter, they had to walk all the way back around the track. And we found that they moved much more as a herd. So if one pony decided they wanted a drink and they started going back, then the rest of the herd would follow. So they were moving around much more. We also put in some nice enrichment for them. So horse friendly lots that they could sort of step over and nibble on. Um, this is some uh, very, very low calorie chaff sort of um, in, I think that's a rubber uh, doormat actually. So they could kind of have to lick and nibble it out of there. So what were the results? So these were the ponies um, kind of, I think it was coming out of winter in 2019. So just before we started um, the management intervention. And this was them in about October time that year. So going into winter, we'd gotten them down to a really good weight and almost kind of reset their metabolisms because they were then able to winter out um, on a normal paddock, not on a track system for that winter without actually putting on loads of weight. And then our three ponies, and two of these were the ones that had laminitis. Um, and that was them also around October time, so looking much slimmer. And also, most importantly, none of them had any repeat episodes of laminitis um, after this weight loss. So this is just one example of how we can sort of manage weight, which then has the subsequent positive effect of reducing laminitis risk. Um, we didn't sort of specifically test the ponies for insulin responses or do any blood work, but the vets did say that they've highly likely had equine metabolic syndrome, but we were almost able to kind of reset their clocks. So thank you. Um, so my take home messages then as laminitis is common year round welfare concern, and we should all be aware, anyone that works uh, with horses should be aware of the subtle but common clinical signs. Weight management, and I harp on about this all the time, it is an achievable goal. We can think about managing grazing, supplementary feed, including exercise, and you know, think about being creative. We don't have to keep horses in square paddocks. Um, we have to be aware of the horses and ponies fitting one or multiple of the risk group categories, and they are the ones that require particular vigilance. So having a good relationship with your vet and farrier is really important. Uh, making sure your horses get regular foot care, obviously diagnostic testing for any underlying hormonal disturbances um, and the management of them will also help reduce laminitis risk. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, and World Horse Welfare has great advice in the laminitis leaflet. Um, we also have a collection of advice about uh, laminitis and weight management on the BHS uh, website as well. And if you did want to head over to Care Equine Education on Facebook and give us a like, then uh, we do sort of uh, post regularly on there as well. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Dee, thank you so much. So we've got, and to Sarah, so rich in, in content. We're a bit behind time, but we'll go on a little bit past quarter past because uh, we've had so many great questions come in. Um, Dee, there's quite a few sort of veterinary focused questions. So if I bat any to you that you want to bat across to Sarah, then, then feel free. <laughs> okay. uh, but um, firstly, Sarah, someone's asked about, you know, how long you can box rest um, horses for with that laminitis and you know surely box resting an animal for two for nine months would 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 be not good for its welfare um it's a really tough thing to do and um i think that if you don't if you can avoid doing it it's great but you're we're, we're in the land of doing the least worst things when we get we're talking about box resting for nine months basically if you have a horse that's not responding and it's in pain and it needs that support in order to um, have an acceptable quality of life, then you may have to do it. And that's particularly the case if you're talking about big horses that get laminitis, because obviously the bigger the horse, the more um, uh, serious the whole, the whole uh, distribution of weight is. So in answer to your question, no, it's not ideal box resting horse for nine months but it may be necessary and it's one of the factors you may need to weigh up if it's a horse that really cannot tolerate it and you'll be using all your horse management skills in order to keep it as happy as possible. Brilliant, thank you Sarah uh, and if, um, that's great and keeping the answers really tight because we've got so many to get through. Um, D, um, someone's asked about you know so many feeds and treat products available that most horses do not need, the feed is a huge industry, what part should they play in better advise owners re appropriate feeding? Yeah it's really difficult because they sort of want to sell their products um, so I think I'm quite a big fan of trying to get some independent advice from someone that's not related to a feed company um, to perhaps um, an independent nutritionist or even I think the World Horse Welfare, you have a helpline which can help um, with questions like that. Um, and just sort of what can help you assess what your horse actually needs. And as Sarah, I think mentioned in her talk, the most important thing is to get the right nutrients. And then if they don't need extra calories, they don't really need much more than just a balancer and forage. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And then Dee, sticking with you, track systems, a couple of people have made comments around that, you know, really difficult that the ground is very wet. Yeah, definitely. So what we had to do was um, stop that over winter. But what we found that by having them on that track system from as early as sort of through, from spring, summer and into autumn, it kind of reset them and we were able to let them sort of in a normal field over winter and then we would have, we would have put them back onto the track when it dried up and it is difficult and some people spend loads of money sort of surfacing their tracks as well um, which I, I know is not an option for everyone yeah Thank you. So a few questions around metformin and its role and someone, um, Lisa has said that her pony was had laminitis in July, tested positive for EMS, put on metformin. She's on a strict sort of protocol. Uh, she's completely sound and, and she's very closely monitored. But the vet now said metformin will no longer be effective because she's been on it for longer than three months. What's, what's your opinion on that? Should she stop medicating her? Um, great. Uh well, starters, you need to consult with your vet for specific advice about that. Um, broadly speaking, the jury's a bit out on metformin. Um, some people swear at it, some people swear by it. Um, and one of the reasons why uh, people think they get slightly less good results with it is when they have been on it for long periods. So you may need to come off it for a bit and go back on it. But as I say, you must be guided by your own vet. Um, Initially, when it came out, we were quite excited about metformin, but I think that, as I say, there's been conflicting research as to whether it works. Sometimes it seems to work, sometimes it doesn't. 
usually the people that are on it are already the type of clients who are doing everything right in terms of management so it's it's hard to be sure which which is doing the job well, and then Sarah, sticking with you, the question around pain management, obviously, uh, what do you use? Butte, um, is that the best one? Someone's asked whether you can use salicyclic acid, you know, aspirin, what would, what would you recommend? Um, aspirin is useful in terms of uh, dealing with the, the sequence of changes that cause the problem. So we're looking at circulatory problems, starting off the, the, the chain of events that culminates in laminitis. And as you know from, from human use, aspirin is very good at stopping um, blood clots because it makes the blood cells less sticky. Having said that, um, we've slightly gone away from using aspirin, um, particularly in the later stages, and because it's associated with more irritation and gastric ulceration. So a form of bute, uh, usually, Sometimes you back it up with paracetamol. Occasionally the vet might have to nerve block them to get them over really difficult periods, but always feed um, any anti-inflammatory in conjunction with forage. Don't ever give it to them, you know, even with just a handful of forage. So when you're back, when they're going to get their main hay net of the day, for instance. Um, so yes, I'm rather boring and mute, but remember that a lot of the pain is the instability. So the feet must be supported. Thank you, Sarah. And I should have said it's brilliant. We've got so many questions and so many questions coming in from around the world, um, from Lithuania and elsewhere. Um, Davina um, D has asked, um, if you have to move paddocks onto fresh grass a couple of times a year, what is the best way to prepare for fields for laminitis, the laminitic prone pony? Is the grass best left long or mowed short? I think I'll, I'll go back to my um, thing about volume. So whether you have lots of short grass or whether you have long grass it I think comes down to how much of it they can actually eat at any one time um, so some people will say well short grass is very stressed and high in sugar long grass is better but I think volume wise <laughs> if they eat a lot of the long grass it's going to they're going to be getting as much sugar as they get in the short grass so I would just think about kind of limiting how much they can eat of whatever grass and then just constantly monitoring yeah can i just chip in on that yeah, go for it. um my preferred grass um is the really rough horrible looking paddocks that you see because because they, i absolutely agree with everything d says but once the grass has flowered then you get more lignin in the grass which is undigestible carbohydrates so they're basically eating rubbish which is very low nutrient density, but it's a good gut fill. The trouble with turning them out on those really low pastures when you're strip grazing them is the stuff that comes through is very high octane. So I'm a big fan of rubbish grazing. <laughs> yes. I suppose that's where they've come from, isn't it? You know, grazing, you know, that's a natural evolutionary path. Um, Dee, I love this question from Angela. Um, she's completely discounted rehoming a cob because her, her paddocks are on grade one silt where the grass grows as you watch it. But yeah. now having looked at your graph on breed, should she reconsider it? Well, I think it's very much down to the individual horse as well, I think. Um, but at certainly don't think you should discount cobs at all have being an owner of a cob <laughs> absolutely if you do want a, a, a cob angela then please come to world horse welfare because we have a, a good wonderful selection that you can rehome and uh, with the wonderful tag your cob can so absolutely um D D sarah judy's asked do you think stress could be a trigger for laminitis yes definitely um and just go back to what we were saying about um cortisol so cortisol goes up in your system when you're stressed and cortisol is involved in the whole um, insulin thing. And I think, and then go back to keeping a diary, I think when you get these unexpected um, flare ups in these EMS animals, I suspect there's a stress um, factor in there. So yes, and I remember years ago, um, talking to the donkey sanctuary people and they had animals that got laminitis after they'd all been uh, grouped together and wormed and they you know that that was repeated each time certain animals were wormed so I that, that won't be the worm that'll be presumably the handling and all the rest of it can I chip in on that quick go for it yeah yeah and I think also importantly to consider stress um, in the management of laminitis because we often say you know 
box rest and stuff, but that can be <sighs> taken also away from its friends and they might get very stressed being alone in a box. So kind of considering how we can help that experience for them be less stressful in their recovery as well. Absolutely. And that feeds back to that third question that Sarah answered about, you know, how well ponies can cope or horses can cope with that. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, I'm going to read out a message from Charlotte, which is which is heart rendering, but I suppose and it picks very much up on, you know, you know, expect the unexpected. She had a horse who had EMS and Cushing's. He was 13, never had any signs prior and actually struggled to keep the weight on him. I didn't know he had these uh, diseases until the day he had laminitis, but no prior signs. He didn't stable well as he lived out all his life. And so his pedal bone dropped and I had to make the difficult choice to put him to sleep. It was the most awful experience I had faced. I suppose it just shows you, Dee, that it really, you know, you, it, it, it can happen to anyone yeah definitely and that's that's very we're very sorry to hear that charlotte um and yeah it is that and unfortunately what often happens is that the horse will get laminitis and then we'll investigate why and then we'll find out that they have ems or, or ppid or something like that so trying to kind of as much as we can be preventive rather than reactive um, to situations but yeah that's definitely and and with with PPID that can sometimes be a sign that they lose muscle so there's muscle wastage so they can look actually skinny but then they might have these fat pads and you might look at them and think oh I need to actually feed them up even more and um, so be quite, quite careful with with that. Sure and um, Sarah a question from Fiona we are on um on month three of box rest of our battle with PPID of 22 year old Welsh A pony who was underweight, soaked hay, re regular trims, minimal feed of balancer and sprinkle of chaff. Any other advice as he's responding very slowly? No, not really. Um, keep, keep, don't give up yet. That would be my thing. As long as you can keep the pony comfortable, don't give up yet. I mean, that's the thing about your nine months really. It, nobody wants to put a horse in a stable for nine months but if that's what you need to do and sometimes they take a long time to recover um, but do keep them comfortable so if you have to feed them you know you must keep up the pain relief and and all the correct management and then you've just got to keep reassessing them and if necessary you might want to redo your x-rays and perhaps change your way of trimming slightly but you know it, it's it's a slog and and you know listening to charlotte's story i mean i'm i so feel for you because i've had clients like this they do absolutely everything and and it still doesn't go well and sometimes it's it, that's just how it is you know yeah. Dee's a question from janet I, I feed my horses in half inch hold nets but still need to take food away from them for periods as they can only eat um um, 13 and a half pounds a day and they can go through the nets fairly quickly what would be the longest stretch I should leave horses without hay I think what research tells us is sort of you probably wouldn't want to go more than four hours um, and we have to balance up because we know that if they don't have food for I think the research said six hours but I would probably err on the side of caution and go for four um, it can increase risk of gastric ulceration so we don't want to have them going for very long gaps without food but you know a few gap you know a few gaps without food won't do them much harm sort of smaller gaps brilliant uh, sarah if a metabolic um Kali, as if a metabolic problem has been ruled out as well as other common reasons for laminitis is it possible that an ovarian condition might exist in a mare who exhibits mild laminitis symptoms periodically that seem to resolve on their own after a few days well that's very interesting because in in horses none of these systems exist independently of the others and i know that there's, there is supposed to be a relationship between a high level of estradiol, at estrogen basically, and insulin um, resistance. I don't think we know enough about it in horses is the short answer. I don't know if Dee knows more than me, but um, it's entirely possible. But I would just be absolutely sure that you haven't got any of the more common reasons going on. Brilliant. The, um, Emma's asked, you know, you know, fantastic that more awareness is being made around this issue, but such a shame, and it's not obviously just in the show ring, but in other horse sports, that the unfit, obese ponies and horses are winning. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, definitely. And in some, um, some disciplines, that is quite a recognised problem. Um, and we're hopefully, we're hopefully changing that um, uh, one small step at a time. Um, 
and it just takes i think getting people to recognize because we've almost become normalized that some breeds are meant to be round and plump um, and that's um, as you say sort of rewarded but trying to strip it back to what actually is a healthy weight and you know just because it's a pony it doesn't need to be round it can actually look like a slim pony absolutely a question from Jill, no a comment from Gillian here about how she's off to, to restrict her wee ponies grazing area tomorrow she hopes it's not too late um, and I'm sure it won't be Gillian um, a question from Julie uh, Sarah Hay versus Haylidge what are your thoughts hey <clears throat> hey please not very nice hey uh, no, in all seriousness no get your forage analyzed and most of the feed big feed companies and and feed suppliers sometimes will do that for you I'm a fan of hay uh, because it's less nutritious, obviously a lower water content. Um, soak it if you need to reduce the um, reduce the nutrient value still further. I'm also a big fan of barley straw, and I think you can feed at least 25% of their forage ration as barley straw, either because you've bedded them on it and they're going to eat some, or put it in the hay net with the uh, with the hay. But provided their teeth are all right and they're drinking all right. Barley straw for me is a great feed to get weight off horses. Brilliant. And I've just seen Liesl, who's listening to us in Australia. She's just taking her kids off to school. And Liesl, you will be able to find on our YouTube channel a recording of this evening's presentation, or for you, this morning's presentation, because uh, I know you've got, you've, got, you've got to move on to, to get the kids to school. Um, th th there's a question here that I've now lost. Um, Yes, so Simone, um, uh, Sarah's asked, when her pony had laminitis, she was told to box rest, but it was also important to allow them a small area to walk if they wanted to, as the blood circulation was just as important for recovery. Yeah, Is it's another of these, uh, you know, again, we used to stand them in streams and force them to exercise at one time. Um, once they're, they're pain free without medication, that's fine. Um, this little pony I've got, I've got those really, I'm a great fan of those field gateway mats with the holes in them. And so she has got her stable and four of those on the yard so that she's never actually standing on the concrete. And they're really good because they're really squishy, those mats. Um, so when they're at the point where they can do it, exercise is better for the whole pony um obviously and also there is this thought that it helps the circulation of the feet but it's it's at the stage when you've got over your acute crisis um and they're up, you know the pain is under control so yes but at yeah. the right stage question from claire i feel for you my lamy prone mare can demolish a three kilogram small hold hay net in 30 minutes how can i make forage last longer so she's not going for long periods without food d any thoughts um yeah so if if she's sound and sort of not um not uh, laminitic at the time then um splitting it into smaller nets and maybe dotting it around the field so she has to kind of walk around and work for it um you can get some of them if she's unshod the that go on the floor so actually the horses will kind of move with the net rather than just standing in one place um, and as Sarah also mentioned, um, straw as well. So rather than kind of reducing the amount of, of forage, um, replacing some of it with more content, but less nutrition. So substituting some of the hay for straw will give us something to chew on and, and eat, but without the calories. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a question here about from Helen, Sarah. Vets and farriers could advise owners re weighty ponies, but seem reluctant to discuss with owners as part of routine routine visits. How can this be improved? I don't know. You need to ask your vet. Uh, I think. I mean, basically, it's it's about time. It's about communication. It's about developing a really good relationship with your vet. Um, I think. Horse owners quite often will use different vets at the same time, or they'll use all of the vets that come to the yard, or it's really important to develop a relationship with your vet when things are good. Um, and, and so that you can have these conversations with them. And so that when you need them, when you have a crisis going on, you know each other well. So this is one of those situations where you know, when you're having something like your routine vaccination, you can tell them in, in advance that you're going to want to discuss it with them. But bear in mind, vets aren't specialist nutritionists. You know, you might be better off 
although obviously as Dee says, when you speak to a nutritionist from a company, obviously they, they're going to have a vested interest. But in terms of general advice, you might be better off with the more detailed and more um, deeper uh, knowledge that a, a nutritionist has because vets actually don't get very much um, education about nutrition. Yeah. Um, listen, thank you so much. I keep on thinking we're doing quite well in questions and then more come through. We're being swamped. But so um, a couple more and then we'll have to draw it to a close. D, someone, uh, Alona's asked, uh, is Alpha Alpha allowed for laminitic horses? Alpha Alpha. Um, technically, it's high in protein and low in sugars. So, yes, but I don't, I think some people say their horses don't always tolerate it. Uh, so it just depends on, I think, your individual horse and whether they will eat off of and do okay with it but technically yeah i think sarah yeah. was nodding <laughs> um and sarah two, two parts of this do you soak barley halls do you soak barley straw too no no uh, again if you needed to reduce what little nutrition there is in it then soaking it will help that and i guess we'll probably make it more digestible um i'm not sure whether it would be more likely to to uh, ferment well if you've soaked it for 24 hours and then fed it i don't don't know about that i tend not to i just feed it as it is um i just or just have uh, something about that so i was speaking to alex from the donkey, donkey sanctuary she said that they don't they tend to dampen it down if it's too dusty but they don't soak it because they found that that um, the donkeys would actually eat more of it um and it could actually cause impaction because they would eat it more quickly yeah. okay um so i would probably say no <laughs> yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? And then Sarah, um, d d final question, a, a few questions around miniatures. One, and, and Jane said, what should I give my miniature? He's just started showing signs of laminitis. I'm shutting him up at night with oat straw and a small amount of hay. That's pretty good. If he is a miniature, just make sure that you aren't overfeeding him because it, it's quite difficult with them to judge their weight. So yeah. make, get your weight tape out and, and check that you're not overfeeding him and work out your one and a half percent of body weight um and shut him up for longer if necessary brilliant listen i didn't warn either of you this but um what we've cut we've got as ever we've covered lots of ground and um it would be great if you could just give us some final i know both of your final slides were take home messages but having heard the discussion um and each other um sarah what would be your final take home message well apart from saying don't get it in the first place um, when you think of a pony a horse as a whole entity, so you're looking at the diet to affect their feet and, you know, just things like feeding hay before you turn them out and stuff like that. So you buffer the effect of those nutrients. So think of the whole horse, but please, please, please don't get it in the first place. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. And Dee? I think just um, there's a lot of different ways that we can affect management but think what works best for you and your horse um, and what you can manage and yeah be creative think outside the box brilliant well listen um sarah and d thank you we, we could have gone on till midnight and past and uh, we, we still wouldn't have got through all the questions so thank you so much for for being with us this evening um and providing such a sort of a fascinating couple of discussions uh, presentations and then a really really good discussion and a thank you to everyone for sending in your questions i do apologize we haven't got through all of them um but you know hopefully we've got a really good flavor and that's been helpful um we've been putting up in the chat function there on zoom and and also on Facebook, a number of materials to, to go through to, to, uh, to, to, to help you. Um, and as Dee said, you know, through the World Horse Welfare, but also through the British Horse Society sites, there is information out there. And I think it's a, as a matter, uh, it, it, there is so much information out there. It's just, I guess, another warning is to make sure that you get your advice, as Sarah talks about, you know, from your vet, have that discussion so you can get, make sure you're getting current advice uh, and that's real value. So thank you for joining us. That brings us to the end and the 14th and, and last uh, Wednesday webinar for 2020. What a year it's been. Um, when we started here in June, um, Lord knows what we thought we'd be in December, and I'm not sure we're any clearer now. But 
it is the time to obviously reflect there over the course of the year and to say thank you for all your support. Uh, a special thank you again to Sarah and Dee for joining us this evening and, and to all of you. Um, clearly, it is the time to, um, to be, be Christmassy. So there you go, a nice little Christmassy end to it. Um, whilst you're feeling Christmassy, um, please remember that if you've got thoughts on what we could do for our 2021 webinars, uh, then please do send them through to education at worldtourswelfare.org. In the meantime, thank you again, wishing you all, all the best, and uh, I hope you have a, a restful and peaceful Christmas, if you can. Look after yourself, look after your horses, and we look forward to seeing you early in the new year. Thank you so much.